truth. Where did Lori go? She's home. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Um, you can ask Lori if this is true or not. She'll let you know. You know, Pastor Lenny is not afraid to let you know that as a pastor and as this minister that stands up in front of you week after week, that I preach three, four, five messages a week. And you think I'm that that, that like Pastor, Pastor Lenny's no different than you. I have the same thoughts at times. I go through the same feelings at times. I go through the same frustrations at times. I don't know that there's too many ministers or preachers or whatever that will make that statement. I want you to want you to think or they want to make it make you think or or whatever, I don't know. That they got it all together, that they're always over, you know, victorious overall, and you know, never any nothing ever comes their way. You know, no viruses, no sniffles, no this, no that. I'm telling you, there's not a man I don't know. There's not a man I don't know that hasn't had something come up on him. I think sometimes if we, we, we would be honest with people, it might help them. They, they, they right? They, they, you know what? They feel a little bit better. No, we're not supposed to live faith, life by faith. We're supposed to live life by feelings. But you know what? Feelings do matter. And one of the feelings that I try to help crush in people's lives is guilt, shame, and condemnation. So last night, I went to bed. I don't, I don't, Pastor Lori walked into the bedroom. And I yelled out, I'm not going to church tomorrow. I'm calling up everybody. I'm posting on Facebook. I'm canceling it. I'm not going. So I'm frust frustrated over a few things. I went to bed. And through the night, Holy Spirit ministered to me. Help me get rid of my stinking thinking. Help me get my focus right. And that's when I woke up. I woke up at like 5 in the morning. Thank God I woke up at 5 in the morning because I would later find out that I was supposed to turn the clock ahead, but I didn't. So I got up at 5 o'clock. By the time it was 5.30, I was, I was in my favorite seat. My light on, and, and, and the Holy Spirit was just downloading to me, you know, a message. Now listen, I got about a thousand messages in stock. I, I can stand up at any time, you know, and I can preach. But I don't want to do that. You know, I, I can get some, I can come up with some good messages, fire you up, and, you know, but I don't want to do that. I want, I want something to come from the Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit gave me, gave me a message. And I, I believe he, he used what I was feeling to give me this message to help you guys in what you're feeling. You know, some of the things that Pastor Lenny thinks at times, I'm tired, you know. I'm just tired. How many of you said, I'm tired? Holy Spirit said, well then stop toiling. Stop trying to figure it out then. You're trying to use your brain, not the mind of Christ. You're trying to use your brain to figure things out. I'm tired. I'm weary. I'm just, I'm weary. I just want to sleep in bed for a week. I'm just weary. Again. You know. I've been working too hard. That's the truth, right? Right, honey? My wife is with me today. You know, because of the clocks. We forgot to set them back. I guarantee you some people forgot to set their clocks back, especially all the kids, all the parents with kids that are up here. So my wife gets to sit out here, and I love when my wife is with me. And she'll tell you. You're, you're working. She called my mind, my soul, a file cabinet. 
She says, Len, your file cabinet doesn't have the paperwork to get you out of this. Huh. So stop looking to your file cabinet. The Lord's got it. Okay. And I'm standing. I'm standing. I've been standing. I've been fighting. I'm waging war against the enemy. I'm commanding. I'm a good soldier. But you know what? I started thinking, maybe I need to preach like that. Maybe I, like, I need to be like that. You know what? Because I was just... I'm not talking about a guy. I'm not gonna, that's not what I'm doing. But I was just listening to a message. And this man was there. You gotta fight! You know? You gotta stand! You gotta you gotta command you and everybody go, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry. That's the power of the soul. That's not the power of the spirit. Then they leave all pumped and excited, and then they get home, and it's like, it's not working, I'm tired, I've been standing. Yeah, you have. That's why you're tired. You've been fighting. That's why you're tired. You've been waging war. That's why you're tired. You've been commanding. That's why you're tired. I'm tired, I'm worn out, I give up. Good. Good. Give up. Is it right so far? I don't, even, I don't even know. It's just, Excellent. I don't even know. Yep. Then we hear Jesus. Then we hear Jesus. Get your swords. Fight. Get ready. No. Nope. Come unto me, all ye are laborers, that you labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I am meek, I am lowly in heart. You know what that means? It, this does not mean I'm meek and lowly in heart. That is saying my heart has no worry. And you will find rests for your souls. For my yoke Listen, not religion's yoke. You must, you have to, you can, you need to, right? My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Then Jesus says, therefore, stop saying, stop worrying about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, how you're going to be clothed, you know, and everything else. All these things do the Gentiles worry about. Your Heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. So now look what the Bible tells us to do. Okay? Let us enter His rest. I'm going to read from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1 through 7. Now God has offered to us the same promise. God has offered to us the same promise of entering into his realm of resting in confident faith. So we must be extremely careful to ensure that we all embrace the fullness of that promise and not fail to experience it. For we have heard the good news of deliverance just as they did. Yet they didn't join their faith with the word. See, faith comes by hearing. They heard it, but they didn't respond to it. Instead, what they heard didn't affect them deeply, for they doubted. For those of us, those of us who believe, when they hear, faith activates the promise, and we experience the realm of confident rest. For he has said, I was grieved with them and made a solemn oath. They will never enter into the calming rest of the Holy Spirit. You see, when you toil 
And when you work, and when you labor, the Lord says, you will not enter into the rest that I have prepared for you. God's works have all been completed from the foundation of the world. For it says in the scripture, and on the seventh day God rested from all his works. And again, as stated before, they will never enter into my calming place of rest. This is vitally important, guys. As long as you think it's up to you, as long as you think it's a work that you must do, that you need to do, as long as you believe the lies that you now have a responsibility, that you now have an obligation, you will never enter into his rest. Because as the Bible says in, Matt, in, in Romans chapter 5, verse 19, through the disobedience of the one, many were made sinners, but through the obedience, through the obedience of that one, we all were made righteous. His obedience. His obedience. Those who first heard the good news of deliverance failed to enter into the realm of faith's rest because of their unbelieving hearts. Yet the fact remains that we still have the opportunity to enter into the faith rest life and experience the fulfillment of the promises. For God still has ordained a day for us to enter into called today. Today we enter into that rest. For it was long afterwards that God repeated it in David's words, If only today you would listen to his voice and do not harden your hearts. Wow. Wow. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 10 and 11. Wow, when's the last time Pastor Lenny went into the Old Testament? <laughs> You're going into it a lot today. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought you into the land which he swore unto his fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you, to give thee great and goodly cities. Right? Give you great and goodly cities which, you need to listen to this, you did not build. You did not build. And houses full of all good things. Whoa. Which you did not fill. Wow. And wells with beautiful, clear, fresh water digged. Which you did not dig. A lot of work and toil here, huh? and vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant and you will eat from them and be full oh. no work no work do we live in a better covenant than they? Yes. yes I want to look, just look at some of these victories Exodus chapter 14, verse 24 through 27. We're going to go through the Bible. Not all of it, but, you know, some of it. And it came to pass that in the morning, the morning watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians. This is amazing. See, you know, mountain on the left of me. No, that's the right of me. Mountain on the left of me. You know, the Egyptians behind me and the sea in front of me. You know, what am I going to do? I'm not going to have to swim. Oh, wow. You know, I'm not going to have to swim. I'm not going to have to surrender, you know. But anyway, they were in a precarious situation. We have a better covenant. Now, look at what the Lord did. I didn't understand this. The water separated, right? And they walked through on dry, dry ground. And then the Egyptians followed with the chariots. Mm -hmm. The chariots followed. Mighty chariots, right, with spears, spears, and swords, ready, ready. They weren't going to take back prisoners. And the first thing it says, listen, I, I never really picked this up, all right, like I did now. It says, and he troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels. You guys remember that? He made their wheels fall off. 
stuck. They were stuck. They couldn't get out if they wanted to. They couldn't escape if they wanted to. Could you imagine you're on the highway and you're trying to drive somewhere and all four of your tires go flat? <laughs> you can't go anywhere. This is amazing. They were stuck. They were stuck. See, Satan, we hear this talk about, oh, the, the enemy is after me. The devil is after me. No, he's not, because he knows if, if, if we just enter this rest, the promises, yes and amen, that he's going to be stuck, and he doesn't want to get stuck. You know? Anyway, and it says, uh, uh, and the chariot, the, the wheels fell off the chariots. Then they drave them heavily. In other words, they just they couldn't steer them. You know? So that the Egyptians said, let's flee, let's flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord is fighting for them against the Egyptians. And, okay, we know the rest of the story, right? They were all they were all demolished. Yep. They were all demolished. They were all destroyed. Yep. Did, you, did, did, did the Israelites have to fight? No. Nope. Did, did the Israelites have to pick up a sword? No. Did the Israelites have to pick up a stick or pick up a rock? No. Nope. He fought for them. He did it for them. He did it for them. I wonder how many times I tried to Google it because I know there's a lot of times where there was a great victory and the nation of Israel did not do anything. Right. Yeah. There's tons of them. Yeah. And now we look at Joshua chapter 6, verse 20 and 21. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets. And it came to pass, when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout, that the walls fell down. They didn't, need, they didn't need any demolition, you know, construction, dem, what's it called? Demolition equipment. A big machine with the, with the chain and the, the three-ton ball that comes and knocks down walls, you know, because Jericho was really fortified. No. Praise, shouts of praise, walls came down. Total annihilation. Wow. Joshua chapter 10, verse 11. This is amazing. And it came, you remember, this is where Joshua said, Sun and moon, stand thou still. And he commanded them to stay still for, for 24 hours. That's powerful. You've got to read chapter 10. Because he wanted the victory to be complete. But this is what it says there. And it came to pass as they fled before Israel. They were trying to get away. But as they were trying to get away from Israel, the Lord, the Lord cast down great hailstones from heaven upon them, and they died. There were so many more which died with the hailstones than whom the ch children of Israel slew with the sword. God did it. God took care of it. This was amazing. 2 Kings chapter 6, 16 and 17. And he answered, Fear not, for they be with us are more than they that be with them. Amen. And Elijah prayed. Now look, look at Elijah's having his morning coffee. I don't know what did they drink in the morning then, back then, Lord. It was either wine, a glass of wine, or co coffee. I don't know. <laughs> and he was reading the, the, the Israel Gazette, you know. <laughs> and he was with Gehazi. I don't know if it was Elijah or Elijah. It's with Elijah. He's with his servant. And his servant, man, he chewed off all the fingernails on his fingers. Because he's looking outside at this massive army. Nope. And it's just Elijah. Elijah's just drinking his coffee and having nope. reading his newspaper. You know? And he tells his servant, Will you, come on, man, would you stop worrying? Right? Will you stop worrying? Those that are with us are greater than those that are with him. He goes, the, Elijah, did you look outside yet? <laughs> right? So it's a... So he says, Elijah prayed, he said, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened his eyes, of the, the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elijah. Oh, and then we have 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 18 and 19. Jehoshaphat. He didn't stand a chance against the armies he was fighting against, against the uh, Amnon and the Moabites. And he, was, he was headed for annihilation. And what he did, 
They sent out the praisers. They sent out the praisers. And the Lord, the Lord, set ambushments against the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. Didn't have to lift up a finger. 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 35. This one's, more, this one's so powerful. You would think that if the nation of Israel knew this story, they would just sit back and do nothing except praise and worship the Lord. Do you know how powerful an angel of God is? Yeah. The, the Bible says that he has set forth ministry, ministering spirits to minister to us. Angels. Do you know how powerful an angel is? You do, Lord? Pretty powerful. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord, one angel, one angel went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians. And hundred, four score, and five thousand. Do you know what that is? One hundred and eighty-five thousand soldiers. One angel smote. One hundred and eighty-five thousand well-trained armed militia from the Assyrians. Wow. And when the nation of Israel, when they woke up early in the morning, behold. All that surrounded them was dead corpses. <laughs> wow! Now, remember I said we live in a better covenant? Yeah. The Lord has a rest prepared for us? Mm -hmm. Let's look to the New Testament now for a minute. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, finished. And he bowed his head. And he gave up his spirit. What did he mean by finished? Finished. We hear it all the time. The finished works of Jesus. The finished works of Christ. Finished. This is ours. This is for our, for our, for our, for our good. These are our promises. See, everything and everything that, that, that the Old Testament lived in, all their promises, right? They're not conditional for us anymore. All the promises in Jesus Christ for us are just yes and amen. Because he met all the conditions. But here, when you look up, what's the finished works of Jesus? This is what you're going to find out. That this declaration on the cross meant, meant by Jesus, that Jesus was saying, finished. What was finished? Our healing. Our deliverance, our prosperity, our victory, our joy, our peace, and everything else we would ever need in life. It's already finished and already there for us to simply claim. Not by fighting, not by standing, not by commanding, but by resting. By resting. And it tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, that in the ages to come, do you know what it means in the ages to come? When Jesus came and when he died on the cross. In the ages to come, the Father might show his exceeding riches, the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by his grace, for by his love, his grace, you are saved. You are safe. You are healed. You are delivered. You are made prosperous. You will have victory. You have joy and peace and everything else you need. For by His grace you are saved. Through faith. Now, grace and the faith, everything, it's not of yourselves. None of it is of yourselves. It's all a gift of God. It's all a gift. Not of works. Never of works. Lest any man should, should boast. Let us work, labor, what? Enter the rest. Enter the rest. Mm -hmm. Do you know, it, it, you know, if we could just have Bibles that would just speak the way, you know, Paul was speaking, we would under, could understand what Paul was really saying, instead of having these translations that are, that are so many times off with their wording and, and, uh, 
you know, the instructions of the translators that they were given. And, and there's so many words there that mean so many, you know, you know, be a good soldier. Like the farmer, you know, fight, fight the good fight, you know. Yeah. Study, show yourself approved. You know what Paul was saying when he was saying all that? He was saying, yeah, Timothy, you're going to have to fight. And you're going to have to be a soldier. You're going to be, have to be like that farmer. Why, Timothy? You know, why, why Paul? Why, Timothy? Well, you know, I, fought, I had a fight, too. You did? Yeah. I had a fight every time they whipped me. Every time they beat me. Every time they, they used, they used what do you call them? Uh, um, rods. But rods to beat, my, to beat my shins. You know, every time they, they tried to take my life, they tried to throw me in a pit and stone me to death. Yeah, I had to be, I had to be a good soldier. I had, what do you mean? I had to stand firm in my faith for Jesus Christ for righteousness. That is the only fighting and that's the only standing that Paul tells us we need to do. You keep things in context, and you will find out that the only fight we need to fight, and the only stand we have to make, and the only standing we need to, to do, is in the fact of our righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. Because everywhere we turn around and everywhere we go, people are going to make, it, make us feel and make us think that it is up to us, that it's up to us, that we need to do, that we have to do, that we have to work. And that frustrates the grace of God and keeps us from His rest. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now think about this. That in, the, that in the ages to come, He might show His exceeding riches. So what is this saying? That God wants to what? Show His exceeding riches. Right? Do we see this? Contact? Show the exceeding riches of His grace. He wants to show the exceeding greatness of His kindness, right, of his, towards us in Jesus Christ. Because it's all a gift, and it's not by works, lest any man should boast. Now, here we go, because of our Bibles, the next thing it says is, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should just walk in them. So now we turn this beautiful passage of Scripture into, you have been created in Christ Jesus now to do good works. Paul, how are you getting from saved by grace, through faith, none of works, lest any man should boast? That never changes. That's always the condition. By grace, through faith. But now, here's works that I need to work in. I need to walk in. This is not what Paul is saying here. And you have to understand what Paul is saying here. If you go back to chapter 1, about all we've been blessed with, you go back to, to his prayer about what he's praying for us, right? You go back to what, what took place when we were united with Christ and elevated him to the right hand, with him to the right hand of the Father. What comes after this? All this is saying is, now we are his workmanship. And we have been created in Christ Jesus. If any man be in Christ, He's a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, new things have come. What new things have come? Healing, deliverance, prosperity, victory, joy, peace, and everything else you're going to need. Created in Christ Jesus for all this, for all this, for what? All this exceeding riches, all this exceeding riches, all the kindness of His grace toward us, all the finished works, and this is what God has ordained, that you should just walk in that. See, if we understand the fact that now God just wants us to make our claim and rest and now walk in these finished works, right? You're, I'm walking in these finished works. Why? Because I know they're mine. I know they're mine. Christ ain't finished. They're mine. I've been established in them. I've been sealed in them. I've been anointed. Now I just rest and I relax. I don't have to. I don't have to strive. I don't have to toil. And now I just walk in. I walk in them. I, I walk in them in my life. Pastor Lenny hates what man does to the scriptures. Simple hermeneutics. 
Nobody knows what hermeneutics is. Nobody teaches hermeneutics. Nobody. And so we read the Bible, right, without hermeneutic principles, and they're really easy. Nina, they're really easy, you know, hermeneutics. What's the culture like? What was it like? What was it like in Corinth? They were really immoral there? Okay, what's it, what, what was it like in Rome? Rome, the Jews and the Gentile Christians, they weren't getting along with each other. Yeah? What was it like there? Okay, all right, so, so what was the culture of the day? What was it like there? Who, who, was, who was this letter addressing, right? Who was addressing it? All right, what do you think he was saying? What's the speaker relevance? What's the listener relevance? That's how you get the relevance. That's when you can understand what was really being said there. And know what's a lie and what's not a lie. And don't let religion take scriptures out of context. You know what's been angering me lately? I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what I grew up with. The last several years, I've heard it from many sources. Now, I'm, not, I'm not pointing my finger at anybody, but I've heard it, right, Lord, from, from many sources. I can lose my healing. You can lose your healing. Boy, that's prevalent on the, on the airwaves right now. You know? And they liken it to a teaching that Jesus did in Matthew 12, where he talks about a demon. A demon is cast out, right? A demon is cast out, and he's gone. And now the and now the house is is swept up is swept up and clean, you know. And now this demon needs a place to live. So now he's looking, he's looking, he, and he's going to come back, and he's going to come back and find that at the house that he was, you know, evicted from. It's going to be in good shape, whatever. And he's going to come back, and he's going to bring seven more in the worst. And then in the last case, it's going to be worse than the first case. And this is actually being used. In the body of Christ, relating to healing. That you can lose your healing, but now you're going to have to work to keep it. You're going to have to work, you know, develop, you know, a mentality of fighting and of standing and of commanding. And, and because of that verse of Scripture. Because they rip it out of context. And you know what? I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm very honest, okay? Yeah. I had a bout with cancer. Jesus had a battle with cancer, and he won. He won the battle on the cross. Okay? But when it, ha and when it attacked this body, okay, there were some symptoms, right? The nose, the discharge, the congestion, the ringing ears, the loss of hear hearing. My eyesight was all blurry as, as the tumor was, was marching toward my optic nerve. Headaches. As the tumor was, mar it was working toward my brain, you know, in the nasal passage, I think they said it was the size of, I don't know what, a golf ball, you know, it was large and, and just obstructing and, and, uh, and the throat, the coughing, the coughing because the mucus was coming out and then it was going down, you know, and, and, and so, you know, taught, taught this, oh, I was going to say something, but I can't. Bull crap. And so you know what would happen then? I would get headaches. Headaches would come on me, right? A headache would come. And I would like, oh man. I would get congested. I'm like, oh man, is it is it coming back? Is it coming back? Yeah, is it coming back? Is it coming back? And there's only one scripture that they use to prove that. You understand? Come on, is there anybody here that's heard it? Do you want to know in context if you just would read one more verse you would see where Jesus would say so shall it be to this evil generation. That he is speaking specifically to a group of Pharisees because he called them several times you evil and wicked generation. Jesus Christ was not directing this comment to a born-again believer. He was not directing this comment to a new creation in Christ. This comment that was made was not made to you and I. But if we let religion use their eisegesis, and, and that means they'll find a verse and then now they want to make it say something that it doesn't say, and we don't know what the new covenant is all about. We're going to believe them. And I don't know how many people are living in, in, oh no, it's coming back. Oh no. And they're living in the fear and they're living in the worry. Well, let me tell you something about fear and worry and anxiety. 
a lot of times what brings on what we have is fear, worry, and anxiety. Darn it! So you know what these religious people are doing? They're creating fear, worry, and anxiety. Get rid of it. That scripture was not for you. Evil generations, look me up, test me out. You will find that it's right. It's another teaching I'm, I'm so upset with. It's the Word of God. I've heard that if you receive your healing from someone prayed, and someone has a ministry gift, a ministry gift of faith, a ministry gift of miracles, you know, like you come to somebody and, and they have a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge or, or a gift of healing and you get healed. I've heard that those people lose their healings because they didn't get it on their own. I know you've heard this, guys. I know you've heard this. The ministry gifts. Guess what? We're all supposed to operate in the ministry gifts. Do you know Jesus operated in the ministry gifts? A word of wisdom. A word of knowledge. Oh no, the man you're with right now is not your husband. You know, in fact, you've had seven husbands. Right? Being able to, 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 to how, what is it? Spirits, you know? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, wisdom and understanding spirits. I forget what that is. Discerning of spirits. Peter makes a statement. That's satanic, that statement. Get thee behind me. You, you see all the ministry gifts. He operated in gifts of faith. He operated in gifts of healing. He operated in gifts of miracle. See, Jesus was an example of us and for us. He didn't operate as God. He operated in the fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit. The ministry gifts are all part of His fullness and power. So you want to say that everybody that Jesus healed, they all lost their healing? This is the way we're supposed to operate. This might get me in trouble, Joanne. It's a cop-out. It's a cop-out for me to say, you know, you're, you'll lose your So Because now I'm putting it all on you. Now it's all on you. Now it's all on you. Now it's all on you. Right? Mm -hmm. Now it's all on you. It's all on you. It's all on you. So here it is. This whole thing about workmanship, about soldier, about fighting, about standing. Even, even in Ephesians, you know, put on the full armor of God. The helmet of salvation. What in the world does that mean? That means guard your head with the truth. That means guard your head, fix your head, fix your mind, fix your thoughts on the truth of your salvation, on the truth of all the finished works of Jesus Christ that you've been given, that you've been blessed with, that you have, that are yours. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Put on that breastplate of righteousness, that breastplate that protects your righteousness, that you know you're righteous and that you, let, that you don't let anybody move you off your righteousness. You gird yourself with the truth of the gospel, the truth, the gospel of grace, and if a many man, and any, man, and any man preach another gospel, let him be accursed. If any man adds to this gospel, let him be accursed. If an angel preaches another, let him be accursed. Right? Right? Sword of the Spirit. What is that sword of the Spirit for? Come on. You always say it. Hebrews chapter 4, verse, verse 7, 15. That sword, the double-edged sword that divides down and separates bone and marrow, whatever. You know what that's doing? What's that saying? This word, this, this sword of the Spirit, it separates the unbelief from the belief. It'll say, it will do it for us. He will do it for us as we rest. I'm trying to believe. No, he, he's going to help you with that. I'm trying to. He's going to help you with that. I'm trying. I'm, he's going to do it. He's going to do it. He's going to do it. His work. The spirit. It's the spirit that gives life. The spirit that's going to do it. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, old things have become new. Now he that has established you in Christ and has anointed you is God. Second Corinthians chapter one, verse twenty-one and twenty-two. I'm going through a lot of stuff, aren't I? Yes. You know what? You're not going to remember anything. But maybe you'll remember a small part of it. But then if you were smart, you'd go back to the uh, the website or you'd go back to the, 
Yeah, you go back to the website and you look up videos, okay? Or you get the podcast that's going to come out, you know, tomorrow and listen to this message over and over and over and over and over again. Because you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And the last thing I want to leave you with, quick, quick couple of minutes here. I do not frustrate. This is what Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 21. After he says, if another person preaches another gospel. Why did he do that? Why did he say that? Because there was another gospel being preached. There's, there was a gospel that combined faith in Jesus Christ with works for righteousness. And he's saying, if any man preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. He was calling James the apostle in Jerusalem. He was saying, let him be cursed. Because James was put, putting people and keeping people under the law. People don't know that. People don't want to say that about James. But James was the law dog. Yeah, he might have loved Jesus, and he was preaching faith in Jesus, but he was also preaching righteousness by, by, a per, by, by adherence to the law. And how do we know that? Because it's Galatians. And then, and then Paul said, if, if an angel preaches another gospel, why did you say that, Paul? Well, because I want you to know that the angels brought the law. So like, if the angels come and try to change something, let them be accursed. There's only one gospel, guys. It's all Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's all what Jesus did. It's all Jesus' obedience. It's all Jesus' sacrifice. It's all Jesus. He's the offering. And, and in Galatians 2, I, I, I approached Peter to his face. Why, Peter? Because, Peter, you should have known better. You were the leader of the church. You strayed from the truth. Why? Because you were afraid of Paul. I mean, you were afraid of James. And after he talks about this, he, say, he goes on to say, I will not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ died for no reason at all. You see, if we think that we have to toil, that we have to work, that we have to help, that we have to do, then we are telling the Father, you did not have to send Jesus. He did not have to die. That word frustrate is horrible. This is what it, frustrate means. If you look it up in the dictionary, it means to prevent the plan or an attempted action from progressing or succeeding or being fulfilled. Huh? That's what frustrating means to Webster. Now to Paul, frustrating means, right, I don't frustrate the grace of God. I don't set it aside. This is what his word means. I don't disesteem it. I don't neutralize it. I don't violate it. I don't cast it away. I don't despise it. I don't disannul it. I don't frustrate it. I don't bring it to naught, and I don't reject it. But well, how do you do those things, Paul? By thinking that anything is up to you. By thinking that rightness before God, right standing before God, a right position before God for all the promises that are yes and amen. Right? By believing or thinking that any of it is up to you, you are frustrating grace. So stress equals not resting. Worry equals, right, not realizing that you've been glorified. Anxiety equals, it, it means that you don't believe you've been healed. Working means you have not received the fullness of His grace. It's only through His resting. It's only through surrendering what we have to do, what we have to be, what we have to become, and, and realizing that it was all on Jesus. It's only in that resting and in places of praise and thanksgiving is where we're going to live in the abundance of the fullness of the, of the hat of the overflow that God has restored, stored for us. Amen? I mean, no, I know this was a lot. This was, this was a lot. This was a lot. Lori, I know you're going to tell me this was way too much. It was way too much, but I pray that it blesses you. Father, I thank you for your word. We give you praise, honor, and glory. We thank you that it's finished, it's done. Thank you, Lord, that we are going to have a peaceful rest, knowing that now, right, everything that you've provided, it's already ours, and we're just going to walk in it. We're just going to walk in it every day. We're walking in our healing as we're resting. We're walking in our prosperity as we're resting. We're, walk, we're walking in, in protection as we're resting. We're walking in blessed relationships as we're resting. Resting in the finished works of Jesus Christ. We give you praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, guys. I am so glad you guys made it.